I'm going to discuss the issue of uh, national resilience from Israeli perspective. Um, but let me try to define what is national resilience, since uh, yesterday, as far as I understand, uh, not everyone really liked the term, and I can understand why. Uh, so let, it, let me put it in a very simple words. What is a national resilience? And I'm going to discuss mainly national resilience in context of missile and rockets threat. Uh, therefore, it's the Israeli uh, case. So the, the definition I use is the following. And national resilience is the ability of a nation to prepare for and to cope with major crisis made by nature or by man when providing, while providing uh, the population important services, maintaining important manufacturing, and recover during crisis and after crisis as fast as possible. This is basically the meaning of national resilience. Before dwelling into the Israeli case, I would like to, well, probably to put on the, on, on the screen, but I have no presentation, just so let, you know, imagine you can see the words, you know, uh, flying in the air just in front of you. And the super principle for national resilience is the following, respect the common people. There is a tendency by authorities, there is a tendency by officials uh, to look at the common people from a superior position. This is wrong. People are not objects, they are partners. It's not some sort of a new age approach, uh, postmodern saying, not at all. It's practical matter, how you approach the people, how you demand them to do something. The moral background for demanding people to do something is based, is based upon the assumption that they can do something. And if they can do something, they are partners. And if they are partners, you have to respect them. Very simple. All right, so now the Israeli case. When I need to elaborate about what are the principles uh, for Israel to overcome the formidable threat uh, we have today in the region, I would say the following. First of all, you need to remember that there is no other nation on Earth, as far as I know, that so many rockets and missiles are pointed at this very moment toward its soil. There is nothing like that. And there is an argument whether it's 100,000 rockets and missiles or just, you know, or more than that, 120. So it, it's really irrelevant. It is a formidable threat that becomes uh, from day to day more and more accurate uh, with better range, with bigger warheads, and with more sophisticated ways and methods of launching. So it's not a diminishing threat, it's evolving threat. They become more and more sophisticated. That's, you, know, you, know, you don't need much imagination to understand the following. Do you have any idea how many power plants we have in Israel? I tell you, 15. So you can neutralize Israel electricity, basically by 15 accurate missiles. 
with a warhead of about half a ton. Not very complicated. How many gas facilities we have at sea? Yes, this is the number. You see well. Yes, it's uh, two. That's all. Um, all over Israel, we have only 23 hospitals. There are 68 in New York City. So it's really easy to neutralize Israel's most important infrastructure, most important services. So we need to build a system that could cope with such a threat. The first thing, and you, have, you need to remember that, you never win wars by defense. So first of all, we need a serious offensive capabilities. That's crucial. Because the only way to take during crisis, to take the threat down, to decline the severity of the threat, is by attacking the enemy. The second uh, imperative is by having well-developed um, active defense. What is active defense? No other nation on Earth has such um, active defense system like Israel. We have five layers defense system. Arrow three for the ultra, uh, for the very high altitude. Arrow two to the high altitude. David Sling to the medium altitude. Iron Dome to the low altitude, and adding to that what we call soft defense. Uh, all sorts of means, measures for uh, electric, uh, electronic warfare in order to jam and to disrupt accurate missiles. This system has been developed since the late 80s, and especially after the first Gulf War in 91. And up to now, reach a level which is well developed, but still not developed enough. So we work on that on a daily basis. We invest in that by American aid every year about $750 million every year for, I would say, the last 10 years. Um, beneath these, you know, two imperatives, offensive capability and active defense, we are entering a new professional world of civil defense. And when we talk about civil defense, I would like to mention uh, six imperatives. And all these imperatives are about how to make resilience people, resilience public entities, resilience society. It's all about that. The first thing we need to do is to provide our nation early warning system or alarming system. Think about that as the following. If you have no alarm system, then you expose yourself to probability. Rockets comes. You have no idea they are pointed toward you. You still work and do your job, and suddenly you are hidden. This is a very problematic situation. 
we suffer from this kind of situation during our independence war. You know that during the independence war, Egyptian airplanes started to bomb Tel Aviv vicinity. And they did it for three, four times with very primitive bombs with not much, you know, warheads. But with all that, they killed 135 people, civilians. Unbelievable. Why is that? Because these people had no clue that they are under danger. Not anymore. Today we can provide the citizens of Israel early warning, no matter where they are, no matter what they use on their daily basis. So we can provide um, early warning by siren spread all over Israel, by cell phone, by radio, by the internet. So the basic assumption is that every citizen, no matter what is, what is or what are his daily habits, can have early warning if he comes under threat. The second imperative is protecting infrastructure. All right, you get the early warning. So you know you are under threat. What to do with that? As far as I know, Israel is the only country on earth uh, where it's mandatory to build protected room or a kind of a shelter in any new building, in every new apartment, in every new business, in every new infrastructure, no matter what is the nature of this infrastructure. You need to build also a protected room or protected rooms. Therefore, today about 80% of the Israeli population has some sort of a shelter. Since this initiative began, in 1992, this is quite an impressive achievement. The third thing to do, the third imperative is the knowledge. All right, so we got an alarm. We know we have a protected room. How we combine them together? How do we know what to do? how to pre prepare the protected room. How much time do I have since I hear the siren to enter the protected room? I need the knowledge. I need some sort of emergency education. And since we are talking about practical issue, it's not enough just knowing that. You also need to practice that. So, in Israel, there are emergency classes for all people in Israel uh, on fifth grade, to all young kids in Israel. It's mandatory. And every firm, every public entity need to provide the workers some sort of emergency education, formally, that made by the Home Front Command. And every second year, we conduct an emergency national exercise. You are well invited to visit. Usually, it happened during June or July. Every second year, all of us, all citizens of Israel, practice. The fourth element is strong units. 
Now you would say, come on, it's not an army. What units are you talking about? Well, there are units in the civilian arena. They just have another name. Local municipalities, factories, public services. Well, you got the idea. Every civilian entity that organizes people in a reasonable number is a kind of a unit. And we need strong units. And we train these units, mainly the local governments, the local municipalities of Israel. In Israel, we have 255 local municipalities. Each municipality has to train at least every three years. Not in the national exercise, as its own, you know, particular exercise. Um, the fifth uh, imperative is effective emergency organizations. You need good police and good medical services and firefighters and so on in order to provide people with services they cannot make by themselves. Um, by the end of the day, when everything falls apart, you need these units. And I would say that adding to, you know, to those organizations who work on a daily basis, which I mentioned already, we have in Israel um, relatively a formidable power acting in the home front, and we call it the home front command, which consists dozens of battalions, expert in evacuation missions, know how to deal with chemical weapon uh, or chemical agents and know how to organize um, people and other public entities in order to strengthen them during crisis. So every local municipality in Israel has its own liaison unit consisting, you know, from 10 to 20 soldiers that enable a local municipality to be connected to the military. Only during crisis, not on a regular basis. But this is the way we structure our system. And the sixth imperative is to neutralize weaknesses before and during the very early stages of any crisis. If you look at Vienna as a public entity, there are points of weakness in Vienna. Um, disabled people, elderly population. You got the idea. So you can minimize the envision problem with this population by helping them at the very early stage. What is helping them? You can take them, you know, to a kind of a shelter. You can evacuate them from the most endangered position. You can bring in to a certain, you know, entity, a company of soldiers to help them. By doing that, we are not allowing weaknesses to become bigger and bigger. So I believe that up to now, you got the overall idea. We cannot command 
the home front. It's not a military unit, but we can provide civilians the very basic tools to meet the challenge and to win the battle. That's something we can do. It doesn't need some sort of a commanding structure, not at all. What we need is people everywhere with strong sense of commitment, with a feeling of independence in a way that lead them to be active and to create an environment, a kind of a public wave that make everyone help his neighbor, not just his family. This sense of responsibility, public responsibility, is extremely important for successful operation during crisis and I believe that you cannot reach that without respecting the people and that's bring me to the point I started with. So I believe right now you can see the overall system and I can tell you from my experience, I commanded the Home Front Command during Castled operation in late 2008, early 2009. And of course, when a crisis erupted, um, there are a lot of problems that you never envisioned before. Uh, this is war. Many unexpected things happen. But, if the foundation of strong, if the common people, the local government, uh, any factory, any infrastructure installation, uh, and the, the um, uh, emergency organization are all ready to cope with that, it's relatively easy to solve the ongoing problems and I would say it's ensure your ability to win the home front arena. Thank you. General Golan, thank you very much for showing us a picture of the resilience of national resilience of Israel. Uh, you pointed out uh, to, to get very close to the people uh, to, uh, let's say, in the demand of uh, protection of Israel to get them as partners. Uh, and you pointed out the early warning system, the air defense, uh, and all those kind uh, what is needed uh, in order to have and to get uh, a protected infrastructure. Thank you very much for that clear picture you gave us. Now we are coming to some questions. Uh, Maybe I take, uh, yes, please, please. Ask. Yes. Yeah. Yes, please, first question, but wait for the microphone, please. Thank you for your very impressive lecture. I have a question about two groups of Israeli citizens. You have a large group of Arab people and a large group of ultra-Orthodox. How are they included in the matter you are giving us? Wonderful questions, because I have a very good answer for that. Uh, I would say the following. Look, nothing surprised me. I, I commanded the Home Front Command for three and a half years. Nothing surprised me more than the reaction of Arabs and ultra-Orthodox to our attempts to organize them for emergency. 
Why is that? Look at the Arab population. We were very afraid, you know, approaching them. We didn't know what will be their reactions. Uh, practically, the reaction was extremely positive. When it comes to emergency, they become, you know, just regular citizens willing to help themselves, really uh, wanting to support their communities. So I um, structure, uh, I arrange three companies, uh, rescue companies, uh, taken from the Arab population. And they were willing to wear, you know, IDF uniform, no problem. I had in one village uh, a woman that volunteered for this company. And she told me, look, you didn't give me hijab. You know, the handcrafts, you know. You don't, you don't have, you know, military hijab. I told her, yes, you are right. I, I don't know what, what to do with that. Don't bother yourself. I'll do it myself. She, you know, she bought, a, you know, fabric in a khaki uh, color and she tailored her own hijab. And, you know, she worked with us, with, you know, a lot of Arab men, you know, just like that. Um, I tried to approach the ultra-Orthodox. So I came to, I approached the chief rabbis of Israel, uh, not only the formal one, also those who are very influential without any formal position. And I told them, look, I need your help. I need to enter the ultra-Orthodox population. What to do with that? They told me the following, you know, no problem. We will command our people to cooperate with you. We want only one thing. All your explanations should be also in Yiddish. You know what is Yiddish? Yes. So, and by that we solve the problem. So we managed to enter all yeshivas and all koilels, and you know, in Israel, that for those who are not familiar, are names of, you know, ultra-Orthodox education uh, facilities. Uh, we managed to enter them and provide them with emergency education. So basically, I would say that when it comes to, um, to a public defense or civil defense, uh, Israel is one entity without differences between the different populations. Yes, it's really a very, very difficult situation. Uh, I think that everybody is familiar that your nation really has an unbelievable drama. But if you observe what is going on in different places, for example, North Korea, we can assess that something is possible. Something is possible. And sometimes big change is possible. What is your opinion? What is possible or what should be done by international organizations, maybe by superpowers, finally to solve the situation? Because this drama, if you observe what is today and what will be tomorrow, nothing is better. From one side, of course, you are strong. You have a good umbrella from the United States. It's very clear, but it's not enough. Because from the other side, you have some, not only one, some countries with not only the opposition, with a big criticism. And no, I can see that their behavior is, the enemy's behavior is not, is not support. How to solve this situation? Because it's not only a problem of Israel. This is a problem of our civilization. Well, this is a very big question, and I'm not sure whether I'm the suitable man to, you know, to solve world problems. Um, my experience is a bit different, you know. Instead of asking for, all right, let's solve this once and for all, I would say, which I believe is not very realistic, I would say that uh, our effort should be invested in lessening the problem, make it less severe, uh, 
creating the right process that diminishing the magnitude of the problem. Um, I think this is the, this is the challenge. Um, I don't think that the world is going to bomb Iran tomorrow morning because the Iranians are bad, Israel are the good. I, I don't think this is a, this will come true, you know, in the near future. But we could make decisions that we define very clearly which countries are peaceful in nature and which are not. And we, the peaceful nations, what we are willing to do, to what extent we are willing to commit ourselves in order to influence on the right direction the less friendly countries. This is a very strong and problematic commitment. In Israel, it's clear. I believe it was quite clear for the United States of America in the years after September 11th. But I think we are not unified enough and we are not willing to commit ourselves uh, in the right way, which not necessarily by violent means, but enable us really to shape our world. But you cannot achieve that without, you know, a strong sense of commitment. And commitment, it's hard. It's less pleasant, it's less convenient than sitting aside and look at the world and what is happening and just, you know, complaining about that. Complaining is not enough. You need to do something. Next question. Bitte, Herr General. Yeah. From time to time, the philosophy changes in armed forces on the mix of highly mobile, mechanized forces and more static forces, infantry and so forth. What is at the time being the perception or the philosophy of the deputy chief of the general staff of Israel on this? All right, this is a very big question, but I, I, I would say, you know, just very few words about it. The nature of war remained the same, but the applications are going to change dramatically, and they are in a changing process. Uh, we don't see much, you know, fighting between armies today. Uh, we fight against, you know, entities which on the one hand are very sophisticated and very capable. On the other hand, they don't maneuver. Uh, they don't need, you know, tanks and APCs. Uh, they extensively use the subterrain. Uh, so you need something else. I used to, used to explain that, you know, to young company soldiers by saying that, look, when I was a company commander uh, and I got a mission, all I needed is my binocular. You know, take it, put it, watching, you know, my mission, and all right, detecting the enemy and make my plan. Today, if a company commander takes his binocular, he sees nothing, nothing. Usually, he sees, you know, buildings, buildings, and more buildings. Where is the enemy exactly? So we need to provide him different binocular, based upon SIGINT, and aerial uh, measures, and radars, and you know, all kind of things which are the modern binocular. That's what we need. I think that most of Western armies today are not well adapted to the new nature of war. I gave you know, an example concerning intelligence, but I would say the same is true about you know, implementing fire in modern battlefield, uh, about the right proportions between infantry and uh, armor units, 
It's about the nature of future tank and APCs, and uh, it's a very much about the way we use the aerial close uh, layer to the ground in a completely different way. Uh, we used to think about that, you know, just uh, a few years ago. So, without el too elaborating, you know, too much about it, I think, you know, some do doctrinal work should be done, uh, and it should be done very fast in order to prepare the future war. Yes, last question. Sir, thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. I have um, a question concerning... You don't need, need to be so polite. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. Uh, I would like to ask you about long-term strategy development of the IDF. So just recently we had the case that a drone um, armed with explosives uh, actually was able to infiltrate the uh, Israeli airspace. It was shot down, of course, but you lost an F-16. Uh, afterwards, which was, I think, a shock for the IDF. On the other side, we have reports uh, from the Gaza Stripe that they were using burning kites. They were even using condoms filled with gas, and uh, we see burning cornfields on Israeli soil. So it looks a little bit that you are reacting always. So how you actually try to develop some kind of long-term strategy when the tactics, uh, procedures, and tactics of the adversary is developing so fast? Well, I think this is a, this is the way you portray it. It's a, is a bit problematic. Why? One thing I learn about strategy and its relation with tactical matters is don't let the tactical matters control the strategy. Uh, what we have today in the Gaza Strip is a tactical matter. What we had in the Golan Heights, you know, with the drone, it's a tactical matter. Yes, we lost, you know, one aircraft. It's not a shock. This is, uh, Israel is still strong enough, you know, to cope with future challenges. I would say that you need a vision. You always need a vision, but this time it's really crucial. You cannot develop some sort of a measure by, you know, using sophisticated technology and solve all problems. For sure, it's also the regular issue of fighting men. It's about determination, cohesiveness, uh, the ability to conscript all your resources in order to cope with the challenge. Uh, it's about, uh, you know, patience. It's about, you know, very conventional things that really shape the destiny of a nation. Uh, I would say that the real issue is to keep the right level of cohesiveness. No nation, no big <clears throat> public is 100% cohesive. But we need the right balance where the cohesive forces are stronger than the seminating forces. And if you reach this, you know, equation, then everything, all the rest is not so important. Yes, we have some tactical you know, problems, and we deal with that. And yes, we react. We react basically because we want, we are a nation of a status quo. We want to freeze the situation. We, we feel okay. Israel is a flourishing country with a wonderful high tech, with a, a very vibrant society. We like our life. This is not the issue. We want to keep it. And the radical elements 
around us want to change the situation, and therefore they challenge us on a daily basis. But up to now, you know, I feel that we, we cope with that in a, in a reasonable way, and we also do here and there some mistakes, you know, this is the life. Thank you very much, General We are going to conclude this session. Some, uh, some uh, months ago, uh, we had a uh, festive event uh, uh, in the, at the reason for 70th anniversary of the State of Israel and the Israel Ambassador accredited to Vienna. Uh, she was here and uh, she showed us uh, in that time the achievements made by the State of Israel uh, the achievements of the society in the last 70 years. And she showed us a picture of Israel. Uh, uh, Israel is a high-tech uh, uh, country and high-tech society. And you rounded up this picture now, today, from the military point of view. Thank you very much. For, and uh, I gave you, you at the last session, I gave you the line, so thank you very much for being here. So, a, se a, se a second thank you must be. Uh, es ist mir eine Ehre, dass Herr General uns mit seiner Anwesenheit ausgezeichnet hat, so viel Zeit uns gewidmet hat und besonders dankbar bin ich für eine der letzten Aussagen. Wir haben hier einen relativ klaren und verlässlichen Argumentationsstrang. Clausewitz spricht vom Chamäleon des Krieges, der seine Form verändert, aber in seiner Natur gleich bleibt. Hoffmann und Mettis, die Urväter des hybriden Krieges und, und, und all dieser Cyberüberlegungen definieren in einer Vielzahl eines mehrgesichtigen, mehr Formen annehmenden Krieges, aber er bleibt in seiner Natur gleich. Und der Herr General hat in seiner Antwort gegipfelt. Das heißt eigentlich, egal wie die Panzer der Zukunft ausschauen, wie viele Rotorblätter die Hubschrauber haben werden, wie ferngesteuert welche Drohne auch sein wird, es wird eines regulären, konventionellen Militärs mit ganz konventionellen Soldaten, mit alten soldatischen Tugenden bedürfen. Das ist die Kernaussage hinter, der Krieg wird seine Natur nicht verändern. Und meine Kritik, und da bin ich vielleicht mit Oberst Hartmann ein bisschen im, im, im dialektischen Missverständnis, nicht die Kritik an den Begriffen der Hybridität, sondern daran, dass er falsch ausgelegt werden kann, indem man nämlich vermeint oder insinuiert, wenn ich nur genug verschiedene Methoden der Gesprächsführung, der Dialektik entwickle, könnte ich irgendwann auf diese Art von Militär verzichten. Und ich denke, dass das die Kernaussage ist, dass wir selbstverständlich Hybridität anerkennen, die Notwendigkeit der Begriffe anerkennen, die Methoden und Konzepte anerkennen, weiterentwickeln, aber vor Fehlentwicklungen warnen, die da sagen oder behaupten, es ginge auch ohne ein konventionelles Militär. Danke, Herr General, für diese Ausführung. Zum Zeitplan darf ich vorschlagen, dass wir kurz pausieren, mit 35 Minuten Verspätung das Programm weiterhalten. Es wird das Pendel Strategische Kommunikation um 14.20 Uhr hier beginnen, das Pendel Strategie internationale Organisationen um 14.20 Uhr im Hörsaal 12. Oberst Rosenitz wird leiten und wird die Damen und Herren, die da willig interessiert sind, von hier zum Hörsaal 12 mit begleiten. Danke für die Aufmerksamkeit. Danke.